Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for an MP webinar covering DEI and ROI, key strategies to boost diversity and improve business. I'm Katie Kreider, marketing specialist here at MP. For those of you joining us on a webinar for the first time, MP is a full service human capital management company. We offer a complete suite of products and services to support organizations through the entire employee life cycle, including recruiting, HR, payroll, benefits administration, time and attendance, and compliance assistance. We support our clients with cutting edge technical solutions, as well as proactive, reliable service and deep HR and payroll expertise. At MP, we are wired for HR and help our clients succeed by aligning their people strategy with their business goals. I'm excited to introduce your presenters for today's program, Sherry Heller and Jen Saray. Sherry is a SHRM and PHR certified HR partner here at MP. She has over 20 years of experience in employee relations, training and development, strategic planning, and policy development. Sherry earned a master's, Master of Education in Instructional Design from UMass. She has spent many years in retail management prior to getting into HR, which provides her with a unique business focus to human resources. Jen is an SHRM Certified HR Partner at MP. She received her BA from Clark University and previously managed HR for the Northeast Division of the National Nonprofit Organization. Jen loves building relationships with her clients while helping them meet their HR goals. Just a few housekeeping issues before we get started here today. If you would like to submit a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. And we will be sending out a recording of the webinar later today, along with the slides. And with that, I'm gonna hand the mic off to Jen. Thank you so much, Katie, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Before we get started, we wanna let you know that this training is intended for educational and informational purposes. While we hope that you learn a lot today, we aren't attorneys and the information we talk about today should not be construed as legal advice. So today we're gonna to start off talking about the changing workforce and why employers really need to pay attention to DEI. And we'll explain the components of DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. We'll give you some tips for hiring for more diverse candidate pools. We'll talk about strategies for creating a more inclusive culture. And last but not least, we'll review how DEI improves business outcomes. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Sherry to get us started on the changing workforce. Thanks, Jen, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, the recent 2020 census showed us just how much the U.S. population has changed, which in turn will significantly change the American workforce. So let's talk about some of the details. Let's see. Um, so America is often referred to as a melting pot, a country with tons of cultures mixed in where everyone is mixed together to a point where you can't separate one from another. Um, I come from you know, a family, my family, my parents were first generation in this country. Uh, when my grandparents came to this country in the uh, early 1900s, they wanted to have a more, they wanted to be Americans, they wanted to assimilate. So my parents' generation, uh, people changed their names. Uh, you'll see that a lot with uh, some of the uh, actors um, and, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, from years ago where they took their very ethnic names from the places from which they came and changed them to be more Americanized. It was, it was what people wanted to do back in the 50s and 60s. But America is more like a mosaic, as Jimmy Carter noted back in 1976. All the different cultures in this country are like the colorful tiles that create a beautiful picture. So in a multicultural or mosaic country, everyone appreciates each other's differences as well as their identities as Americans. Embracing our heritage and being American are not mutually exclusive. We can do both. So the 2020 census res results show that the US population is much more multiracial and more racially and ethnically diverse than ever before. Uh, people of color represented 43% of the total U.S. population in 2020, which is up 34% was up 34% from uh, from 34%. Excuse me, in 2010, the non-Hispanic white share of the U.S. population 
fell to 57% in 2020, which was shrinking by about six percentage points since 2010, the largest, which is the largest decrease of any race or ethnicity. The share of those who identified as Hispanic or Latino or as multiracial grew the most. In addition, the United States aged overall since 2010, and the population younger than 18 became more diverse. So beyond just the 2020 census, the uh, Census Bureau also puts out projections for where the, where the population will be growing. Projections show that whites will decline, the number of older people will increase, and racial minorities, ma mainly Hispanics, will grow the most, making them the main engine of demographic change in the US for the next 10 years and beyond. The year 2030 is gonna mark a demographic turning point in the US. Beginning that year, all us baby boomers will be older than 65. Uh, this will expand the size of the older population so that one in every five Americans is projected to be retirement age. By 2034, it's projected that older adults will outnumber children for the first time in US history. So as I turn the presentation over to Jen, keep in mind that diversity is so much more than just the racial and ethnic differences. And with that, I'll turn it back to Jen. Thank you, Sherry. So we've all heard the term DEI, but what do we actually mean by diversity, equity, and inclusion? Oftentimes these terms are used interchangeably, but they really mean very different things. So for your DEI strategy to be successful, it's important to understand how, what these concepts mean and how they relate to each other. So let's uh, start by talking about diversity. So diversity in the employment context is defined as the collective mixture of differences and similarities that includes, for example, individual and organizational characteristics, values, beliefs, experiences, backgrounds, preferences, and behaviors. Examples of some of these differences are race, ethnicity, and national origin, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, family status, language, age, social class, religion, veteran status, physical ability, generation, physical characteristics, and so on. So we often think about diversity in terms of visible traits, but it's also important to think about diversity in terms of invisible traits or attributes that aren't readily seen, such as diversity of thought, perspectives, and life experiences, which are equally as valuable. When thinking about your diversity strategy, you wanna ensure you're finding ways to connect with candidates who represent the full range of human differences. And now let's talk about, um, we're gonna talk about equity, but also quality versus equity. So in order for employees to have access to opportunities and resources, it's important to understand the difference between equality and equity. Uh, these words are often used interchangeably to reflect the larger goal of fairness and opportunity for everyone, but they do mean different things. An equality approach gives everyone the exact same support to reach their full potential and assumes that everyone starts out from the same starting, port and can, starting point and can be treated identically. So in that first image where everyone's standing on that same um, level uh, box, so that tall person can reach the light bulb, no problem. The person in the middle, eh, maybe if they, they jump, they'll be able to reach it. But the person on the last box is really going to have a hard time reaching that light bulb. An equity approach acknowledges that individuals don't start off the same. Therefore, we need different support to reach their full potential. And these differences exist not only because of temperament and working style, but also because each person enters the workplace from unique social circumstances, such as age, education, race, gender, abilities, personalities, learning styles, motivators, strengths, de de developmental areas, and skills. So now we see the boxes are a little bit different depending on uh, what supports people need to, to meet that goal or reach that light bulb. And companies have equal employment opportunity statements in their job postings, offer letters, and employee handbooks. However, equity is the means to get to the goal of equal opportunities. Equity addresses the needs of today's diverse workforce so that all employees have an equal opportunity to reach their full potential. So um, as an example, let's consider a manufacturing environment where employees haven't had the same educational opportunities, or maybe there are some language barriers. So historically, these employees may have been overlooked for promotion, internal promotions, 
but an employer could take steps to help create more equitable opportunities for upper movement in the company. Uh, this could look like coordinating ESL classes on site after hours or looking at years of experience in the same way that you consider educational degrees. Sometimes we create requirements that aren't actual measure, measures of success in a role that could unintentionally prevent otherwise qualified internal candidates from getting a promotion. Um, so next let's talk about inclusion. An inclusive work environment is one in which all individuals are treated fairly and respectfully, have equal access to opportunities and resources, and can contribute fully to the organization's success. So where diversity asks, who do we bring into our organization? Inclusion asks, how do we make them feel welcome once they get here? Inclusion strategist Vernay Meyer says, diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. If you don't know Vernay, check out her TED Talk. She's a fantastic speaker and presenter. I, I believe we might have um, a link in our resource slides um, as well. But um, I think a really important thing to notice here and to be aware of is that you can have a diverse workforce without having an inclusive culture. Diversity provides the potential for greater innovation and creativity, but inclusion is what enables organizations to realize the benefits of this potential. And it can be easy to get tunnel vision and place all of your focus on who you're bringing into your organization, but it's so important to make sure that there's just as much focus on how employees are made to feel welcome and given a sense of belonging when they come on board. Otherwise, all that hard work you put into onboarding them may have been for nothing. Um, but let's start off talking about um, some steps you can take to start hiring for more diverse talent pools. So, before you hit the ground running, you want to get buy-in from the leadership team. Ensure there's commitment to not only hire, but to retain a diverse work workforce by embracing a culture of inclusion. All of your efforts to recruit a diverse workforce will be wasted if you end up having turnover, issue turnover issues because employees don't feel welcome once they're working for you. Sherry's sure going to give us a deeper dive into how you can create an inclusive culture. So I won't you know, talk too much more about this here, only that it's really important to make sure the team is on board and committed to the work that will be required to create a diverse and inclusive workplace. So um, another tip is to get a sense of how the organization is presenting itself to potential candidates by reevaluating the company website, website and web presence. Take a look up your website and ask yourself, would all people feel represented and welcome based on the images we're, we're featuring? Are the images of people who are all the same age, race, or gender? For example, if you only have pictures of your all white male leadership team on your website, what kind of message could that send to potential candidates? You should also take a look at other places where the company has a web presence, such as LinkedIn, Glassdoor, and other social media accounts. If you have a diverse team, you can reach out and ask employees if they'd like to be featured on the website. I just wanna be clear that employers should not be singling out or pressuring people of color um, from, or people from the LGBTQ uh, a population or differently abled staff, et cetera, to be featured, but rather open up the opportunity to anyone who's interested to be featured on the website. And if you don't currently have a diverse team, you could use stock photos that reflect the diversity that you would like to eventually have. And we know candidates do their research by looking at company websites and other web pages. So it is important to put yourselves in their shoes and ask, could a diverse group of candidates see themselves working here? And then in addition to the images, you should also look at the language that you use, including language in your core values and mission statements. Is there any mention of diversity and inclusion? Can it be added organically? If employers have a DEI, a DEI committee, they may be able to help uh, give input into updating these images and texts. So another thing is to consider um, is uh, ensuring that you're advertising your jobs where diverse candidates will see them. And this does take some effort to go beyond where you've typically posted and considering more schools, job boards, professional associations, as well as state agencies that help underrepresented groups gain skills and find employment. These organizations oftentimes have a contact that will help circulate your job ads for you and can connect you with qualified candidates. Uh, before I worked at MP, I spent the majority of my career at a nonprofit human service agency that as a federal contractor was required to adopt an affirmative action plan. 
I developed relationships with contacts at the state career centers, which included a contact who specifically worked with veterans, as well as the Massachusetts Re Rehabilitation Commission. I had really positive experiences working with these agencies, and we ended up hiring some fantastic employees who I believe are still employed with the organization today. And then also consider offering remote work, especially if you're based in a very homogenous area. We often hear employers say that their physical location is a barrier to attracting diverse candidates, especially if the business isn't located in a major city. A silver lining of the pandemic is that we've seen many jobs that were previously never considered as remote positions can be performed quite successfully, su successfully from an employee's home or a satellite office location. Remote opportunities can also increase opportunities for individuals with disabilities. If you can advertise a position as a remote opportunity, this will certainly open up the talent pool to more diverse candidates across the country. Next, uh, I recommend uh, taking a look at your job, job ads and job descriptions um, and look for these things. Um, look to see if you have any gendered or potentially discriminatory language. For example, Rather than um, calling a position a hostess or a waitress, these jobs are now called host or server to make them gender neutral. And do you use pronoun, the pronouns he or she in your job ads or job descriptions? Using the pronoun they or speaking in the third person is more inclusive to all applicants, regardless of gender or gender identity. You also wanna make sure that job ads don't include language that may discourage or disqualify people from certain groups. For example, saying you're looking for newly qualified candidates or recent graduates may discourage older applicants who are otherwise qualified from applying. And then if the job doesn't require a higher degree, such as a bachelor's degree or master's degree, remove it from the job description or job ad. Higher degrees may create a barrier to a diverse talent pool. And then additionally, research has proven that higher degrees don't always correlate to success in the workplace. A good practice is to take a look at the employees who are currently in the role to determine which prior knowledge, skills, and abilities helped them to be successful and update your job ads and job postings accordingly. Your job descriptions aren't one and done documents, just like your handbook, they should be reviewed and updated annually. And then you should also think about removing preferred and not required qualifications from job posts and job descriptions. Qualified candidates may not apply if they think they won't stand a chance against someone with preferred qualification. And you aren't required to include an equal employment opportunity statement in your job postings unless you're a federal contractor, but it can still be a good idea to send the message that you take diversity and inclusion seriously and won't tolerate discrimination or harassment based on protected characteristics. It's not a good idea to include EEO language to simply check off a box. You do need to make sure your culture and actions will ref reflect your words. Okay, um, next, you should ensure that your hiring process is accessible to people with disabilities. Um, and this starts with your website. Websites that can't be navigated with a screen reader or a keyboard instead of a mouse can make the application process inaccessible to individuals with visual or other disabilities. If you have videos on your website, you can add captions to make the content accessible to people who have hearing impairments. It's also a good idea to provide contact information if a candidate needs assistance or wants to request a paper-based application. You should also check to see if your physical space is accessible to candidates with disabilities. Are doorways wide enough for wheelchair access and are doors easy to open? Is the room where interviews are conducted accessible or is the only way to access it up a flight of stairs? With some forethought, you can prepare an alternate interviewing space that is accessible to all employees and to all candidates. And then consider the optics of who participates in your candidate interviews. During the hiring process, are interviews only conducted by people of the same race, gender, age, and other demographics? It's a bad idea to insert somebody into the process simply because they represent some diversity. But organizations that want to hire for a more diverse and inclusive workplace should think about what their interview panel says to candidates. You may also want to include a manager or someone from human resources who can speak to your DEI initiatives should a candidate have specific questions. As candidates are increasingly looking for employers who share their values, they're also inquiring about diversity makeup of executive and management teams, along with details of the company's practices concerning diversity and inclusion. Next, it's really important to train your hiring team on unconscious bias. Unconscious biases are social stereotypes about certain groups of people that individuals form outside their own conscious awareness. 
Research suggests that unconscious bias occurs automatically as the, the brain makes quick judgments based on past experiences and background. Everyone holds unconscious beliefs about various social and identity groups, and these biases stem from our tendency to organize social worlds by categorizing. Without training, it's easy for hiring managers to be drawn to candidates who remind them of themselves, rather than focusing strictly on the job-related criteria. As part of this training, I think it's also crucial to talk to your managers about the importance of getting names right. Help them feel prepared so they know how to handle situations where they might not know how to pronounce a candidate's name by asking in a polite way, such as, you know, I want to make sure I get your name right. Can you, can you say it again for me? And ensure they know it's not appropriate to make comments such as, I can't say that, or to give someone a nickname because they don't want to try to learn how to say their name correctly. And we also recommend utilizing a standard set of behavioral-based interview questions for all candidates being interviewed for a particular role. And this helps managers remain objective and ensures every candidate is being asked the same job-related questions that will give insight into how successful they would be in the role based on those previous experiences. And another way to help fight unconscious bias is to implement blind hiring practices. Blind hiring involves stripping away information that is not job related that could otherwise lead the hiring manager to make assumptions about the candidate. A name can give a hiring manager insight into a candidate's gender or race. An address could lead to assumptions of race or inc income. Graduation dates often indicate, often indicate age and school names can lead to assumptions of race, religion and socio socioeconomic status. Even hobbies and volunteer opportunities may reveal religion, age, or whether a person has children. This information could be used unintentionally to start to shape a hiring manager's feelings towards a candidate. And many uh, believe the practice of blind hiring began in the 1970s when the almost entirely white and male Toronto Symphony Orchestra was trying to increase its diversity. They started using partitions to conceal the identity of those who are auditioning. And it led to a tremendous shift in the way the whole industry br brought on talent with blind auditionings becoming the norm. The ratio of female mu uh, musicians in the top US orchestras increased from less than 5% in 1970 to 25% in the 1990s. There are applicant tracking systems and other platforms that can help block this information for you, but a Sharpie works just as well. If you take steps to remove identifying information from resumes, hiring managers will, will be able to focus on the content that actually matters and see the candidate for the skills and experience they otherwise might have overlooked due to their own biases. So as I mentioned earlier, it's important to consider the many aspects of human difference and to find ways to connect with workers who represent all of these differences. So I wanna highlight a few underrepresented groups and share recruitment resources and strategies with you. Uh, workers with disabilities bring their skills and talents to the workplace and perform all types of jobs at all levels in businesses of all sizes. Yet people with disabilities have lower rates of employment than the general population. This is true despite people with disabilities often exemplifying the qualities employers seek, including adaptability and resourcefulness. What's more, disability is diversity and therefore a key component of workplace diversity, equity, and inclusion. So the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy supports several initiatives that help employers interested in hiring individuals with disabilities, including the Employer Assistance and Resource Network on Disability, disability Inclusion, or EARN for short, which is a free nationwide service that educates employers about effective strategies for recruiting, hiring, and retaining and advancing people with disabilities. EARN also maintains a list of job posting websites geared toward job seekers with disabilities and a collection of success stories about employers that have made a commitment to disability inclusion. We know that veterans offer many transferable skills into the civilian workforce, like proven leadership, strong work ethic, and integrity. So it makes sense that we'd wanna tap into this talent pool. The Veterans Employment and Training Service is a one-stop location to connect employers with local, state, and federal veteran hiring resources. And the Employer Roadmap is a comprehensive and personalized resource for employers who want to hire veterans and military spouses sponsored by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Hiring Our Heroes Initiative in USAA. And it's also important to post jobs where veterans can find them by sharing your job ads with your local job center. They can assist you in posting your job vacancies at no cost to state job banks or post jobs to the National Labor Exchange at, at veterans.usnlx.com.
The NLX is a partnership between the National Association of State Workforce Agencies and the Direct Employers Association that works by collecting and distributing jobs from, corporation, uh, from corporate websites, state job banks, and USA Jobs. The NLX is used by more than 300,000 employers with an average of 2.9 million daily job postings. That also complies with the Department of Labor's regulations for affirmative action hiring of veterans by federal gov government contractors. Um, as Sherry mentioned, you know, people are living longer and putting off retirement, and there's a whole pool of talented uh, older workers that should be included in your diversity recruitment strategy. Some ideas for effectively recruiting from this group include maintaining a connection with prior employees by creating an alumni uh, social network option on sites like LinkedIn or Facebook. Employers can also host periodic social events for these alumni networks, where the company may be able to entice those older workers to fill the organization's staffing needs. You can also create recruiting partnerships with organizations that specialize in helping older workers locate work opportunities, such as AARP's Life Reimagined for Work program, the American Society for Aging's Career Advantage program, the Senior Community Service Employment program, and community colleges in the Plus 50 Encore Completion program. And consider posting jobs in locations where older uh, job seekers are likely to look. This could include organizations targeting to 50 plus demographics, such as AARP and Senior Job Bank, as well as social media groups. Now, it's important to remember that these are all strategies that will take commitment and some consistent effort to build a diverse workforce over time. You can't expect it to happen overnight. You may have some managers who are particularly passionate or eager to hire candidates from specific underrepresented groups. You might hear a hiring manager say, you know, my team is made up of all men, so we really need to hire a woman for this next open position. So you'll, you'll need to help them understand that the goal is to create more diverse candidate pools that will lead to a more diverse workforce over time. And they need to make sure that they're focusing on the job qualifications when deciding which candidates are best qualified to perform the job and who will be extended an offer of employment. Continual monitoring of your recruitment practices and diversity metrics will be crucial to see if your increased outreach is effective. If your strategies aren't bringing in more diverse candidates, don't get discouraged. Get creative and try something else. You can also tap into your current employee base, employee base to see if they have any suggestions for where you could be sharing your job ads. Now I'm going to turn it over to Sherry to talk about some things you can do to create a more inclusive culture. Helps if I unmute myself, doesn't it? Thanks, Jen. Okay, so as uh, Jen mentioned previously, you can have a diverse workforce without having an inclusive workplace. Um, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to meet um, Carol Folk. Uh, she's the CEO of Folk Diversity LLC and author of Success Through Diversity, Why the Most Inclusive Companies Will Win. Highly recommend, great read. Um, Carol says that diversity is counting the numbers, but inclusion is making those numbers count. Uh, you can do a bang up job of hiring with all these strategies that Jen just laid out um, and hire a diverse, diverse workforce. But if you only focus on diversity and not an inclusive culture, you're going to have a revolving door. You really need to build a culture where everyone feels valued and heard. So where do you even begin with a DEI initiative? Uh, first and foremost, and Jen has already mentioned this, is that you need buy-in from leadership. Uh, it is really important that it's not just a box that we're checking off, but leadership really believes that that diversity and inclusion is going to help um, make them a better organization. Um, next is employee feedback, such as surveys and focus groups. They'll t that'll tell you where you're falling short. Um, don't hesitate to bring in experts. Um, you can bring in uh, diversity uh, experts who can do assessments of your workplace uh, and then also conduct some of those focus groups and surveys, provide you with some really great strategies, uh, as well as trainings for your employees. Um, value employee differences. Um, with the changing population, um, not only is your workforce changing, but your customer and client base is going to change too over time. Um, and, and in order to really um, be successful as a business, you want to be inclusive with everybody, not just your employees, but also with your, with your customers. So valuing those employee differences is really going to give you a leg up because you're really going to be able to get that 
feedback from different types of backgrounds, different types of ethnicities, races, religions, genders, ages, all of that, all of that diversity um, that will help build a stronger business. Um, and then finally, you want to ensure diversity in upper management. I think that's probably one of the most important aspects. Um, to underscore the importance of diversity at the leadership level, you don't have to look any further than professional sports, in particular the NFL. Last season, 71% of NFL players were people of color, but over the past 10 years, 82% of head coaching hires went to white men, and in the general management offices where those decisions, hiring decisions are made, 84% of the GMs are white men. Uh, you know, those of you who are from the local area probably have heard about the uh, issue with the Rooney Rule. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, familiar, the Rooney Rule was a standard in the NFL, basically saying that for every position that you're going to be interviewing for, you have to have a, a, either a person of color or a woman. Um, but uh, very recently, uh, there was an issue where it turned out that that Rooney rule was being adhered to, but only as sort of a, just a, a checkoff box. Yep, we did it. We put it, we put a person of color in there, but there was no intentions or there was already a decision to be hiring somebody else. So clearly the league has a lot of work to do. All right. Um, so over the past couple of years, there's really been a renewed focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. Uh, but with many companies, that only included doing unconscious bias training, maybe adding Juneteenth as a paid holiday, or showing more people of color in their marketing and on their company websites. Uh, organizations often stop short of looking at their company culture and determining ways to create an inclusive workplace. Companies first need to look at structural biases in their policies, practices, codified behaviors, and other aspects of the workplace. So talking about job postings, Jen has already talked a little bit about this. Using terms like recent grad digital, or digital natives can exclude older workers, while re requiring college degrees can exclude those in lower socioeconomic communities. So there's definitely, uh, just in the job postings alone, that is a structural bias that can be built in just with the language that you're using. Uh, dress code policies is another area. Uh, requiring men to wear suits and women to wear skirts or dresses while legal is based on gender stereotypes. By avoiding gender stereotypes, workplace dress codes can accommodate people in the LGBTQ plus community, um, hairstyle discrimination has been, <clears throat> excuse me, has prompted, I'm sorry, hairstyle discrimination in the workplace has prompted many states to enact laws banning it. Not everyone has the same type of hair, and for many people, hairstyles can be an important part of their culture and religion. A restrictive uh, policy, dress, uh, dress code policy might discourage diverse candidates from applying in the future, and in fact, might also damage your company's reputation with its customers. <clears throat> and uh, we also want to focus on inclusive language, not only just in our job ads, but using proper pronouns and replacing he, she with they or employee in your handbooks and other company docs. Um, do you still have Christmas parties and Christmas bonuses? Um, according to 2021 Gallup poll, 69% of Americans identify as Christian. That leaves another 31% of the population who identify with other religions or no religion at all. So maybe we change that to holiday parties and, and holiday bonuses. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then there's the physical workplace. Jen touched on this a little bit, but also considering things like making sure, again, that the workplace is accessible for people with disabilities um, and maybe considering gender neutral bathrooms. Now, if you have so in our office at MP, we have a single person bathrooms. So They're not multi stall. Um, and we had for years a men's room and a women's room. Um, and it really doesn't make any sense. Why can't it just be a restroom that any gender can use? Now, many of you might be in, in buildings where all of your rest, restrooms are uh, sort of multi-stall um, and you want to be, you know, thoughtful of everybody's, you know, how everybody's comfortable in the workplace. Um, you can create gender neutral bathrooms by making, uh, one of my clients recently did the, the uh, bottom floor um, restrooms are gendered restrooms and then the second floor restrooms are gender neutral bathrooms. So that way it gives employees who are who are uh, part of the LGBTQ community um, just uh, making them feel more accepted. 
according to a 2019 Bureau of Labor Statistics report, the entire U.S. population is 77% white, and white workers are significantly more likely to hold managerial positions than Black and Hispanic employees. It's also worse at the top. 93% of CEOs in Fortune 500 companies are white, and two-thirds of C-suite executives are white men. So with so little diversity at the top of the workplace, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, of, uh, the corpor of corporations, it's no wonder that structural biases exist. So how can a company ensure an inclusive workplace if underrepresented and marginalized groups aren't represented in leadership? Senior management should reflect a variety of different cultural backgrounds and perspectives. Uh, another important piece, and uh, again, Jen already sort of touched on this, is using gender inclusive language, uh, which means just speaking and writing in a way that does not discriminate against a particular gender or gender identity and does not perpetuate gender stereotypes. Using gender inclusive language is a powerful way to promote gender equality and eradicate gender bias. Um, those of you who are from up here in the Northeast, um, we commonly will refer to a mixed group, uh, even not a mixed group, maybe an all-female group as you guys. Um, but it's just a conscious effort to, instead of saying ladies and gentlemen, or you guys, or um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, or any other gendered word, you just want to change it up and say, you know, thanks friends, have a great night, or good morning folks, or hi everyone. Uh, there are ways to uh, shift your language, and it does take a conscious effort to do that. Kind of along those same lines is are here are some common words and phrases that are gendered, and let's talk about how those outdated terms can be uh, uh, replaced with uh, other terms. Again, it's a conscious effort to do so, um, but instead of talking about a husband and wife or boyfriend and girlfriend, you want to say spouse or maybe um, significant other. Instead of referring to brothers and sisters, you say siblings. Um, instead of a waiter or a waitress, you've got a server. Um, instead of mankind, humankind. Um, instead of asking on a, on a form for somebody's maiden name, you can say family name. Um, and then if for positions, and this, this goes back, if you think about the change in how we refer to a lot of positions nowadays, the language that we used to use talking about policemen, firemen, chairman, mailman, um, they were all, they all indicated that those jobs weren't for women, just by the nature of the title. So again, making them gender neutral, a mail carrier, a chair, chairperson, a police officer, firefighter, will really help um, embrace that inclusive culture. So another aspect of inclusive language is talking about disabilities. Um, so some words, so what words should we use to refer to people with disabilities is saying the disabled or disabled people acceptable, for example. Um, questions like these are important, particularly because disability represents a form of diversity, similar to a person's gender, race, ethnicity, social class, or religion. So knowing how to sensitively refer to members of diverse groups is also important. So let's begin by de defining some of the terms. So first off, we talk about person first language, which is language that puts a person before their diagnosis, such as being a person with a disability. Identity first language is language that leads with a person's diagnosis, such as a disabled person. Uh, employers should use people first or person first language when communicating about disability issues, whether verbally or in writing. However, it's important to note that many people with disabilities are choosing to use identity first language, such as autistic or disabled. So how a person chooses to self-identify is up to them, and they should not be corrected or admonished if they choose not to use, uh, I, excuse me, uh, person first language. Uh, here are some examples of person first and identity first uh, language that you can use. Uh, one of our coworkers, uh, who's a parent of a physically disabled person, tells us that the ADA and the Easter sales are trying to change the vocabulary because the word disabled has a negative connotation, emphasizing what we can't, what you can't do. They would prefer people use terms like physically challenged or differently abled. So what language is appropriate when referring to a person with a disability? Best approach is to ask the person what language they prefer, prefer, but when in doubt, use person first or people first language. 
All right. Uh, respecting someone's self-identification means using gender pronouns with which they most identify. You've probably seen uh, more commonly lately uh, email signatures that have pronouns listed in there. Um, it's a good practice to ask which pronouns a person uses, uh, not what pronouns a person prefers, because if we say prefers, we're implying that that gender identity or gender um, uh, orientation is a is a preference or sexual orientation is a preference. It's not a preference. It's 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 hardwired. It's biological. So it's not a it's not a preference. So you want to ask what pronouns a person uses. It's not a good practice to assume someone's pronouns based on their outward appearance. So if you don't know or have not asked a person's pronouns, try to use they or them pronouns. So here's a list of some common pronouns. It's by no means an exhaustive list. So always be sure to ask about a person's pronouns. After all, language around gender, sexual orientation, and gender identity and expression can shift rapidly. Companies seeking to be LGBTQ plus inclusive need to be aware of the importance of pronouns to the community and explore appropriate solutions for their workplaces. Whatever approach we take to approach pronouns, bottom line is that everyone deserves to have, deserves to have their self-ascribed name and pronouns respected in the workplace. This pronoun list is not exhaustive again, so always be sure to ask someone's for about someone's pronouns. All right, so let's talk about some tips for uh, creating an inclusive workplace. We've touched on some of these. Jen talked about your company website, um, but you wanna make sure, you wanna ask yourself, does it show a diverse workforce? If you do have a diverse workforce, uh, do applicants from marginalized groups see themselves represented there? Uh, do they see themselves fitting in? Uh, be sure to highlight your DEI initiative as well as the benefits that you offer. Um, hybrid and remote work options are, will again, as Jen mentioned, will broaden your talent pool and it will also allow you to attract more diverse candidates and also to accommodate and uh, make um, more diverse groups feel included. Uh, flexible scheduling is a little different from, from hybrid or remote work, uh, where flexible scheduling can make the workplace more inclusive for, say, parents of young children struggling to find you know, or afford childcare, and those of us caring for aging parents. Um, employee resource groups, uh, also referred to as affinity groups. ERGs are employer-recognized groups that can promote a company's diversity and inclusion efforts and allow for networking, mentorships, and other opportunities for professional and personal development. Uh, create ERGs for people with a wide variety of identities, such as women, Black, Asian, Latinx, LGBTQ, people with disabilities, veterans, working parents, multi-generational employees. Again, the list goes on. Um, also, make sure that you're delegating for opportunity. And what I mean by this is that leaders tend to give the most important projects to the same set of superstars over and over again. You know you can rely on these folks. We're going to give them these projects because we want to get it done, get it done right. Um, but leaders really must be more thoughtful about who receives opportunities. This starts with thinking beyond capabilities, development needs, uh, thinking more about the capabilities, development needs, motivators, um, and availability for all of your team members. Um, also consider celebrating diversity. Um, you can have potluck, uh, potluck lunches where people bring in food that showcases their culture. Um, recognize and celebrate days with significance to other communities, such as Black History Month in February or Pride Month in June. Let's see, another thing to consider is, is part of your um, benefit package is long-term care insurance. So you know, where the demographic is getting older in this country and eventually will in, in, not, in the not too distant future, it's going to outnumber the younger people in the country. It's definitely uh, and it's something to think about. And when I say, you know, your, your older workers, I'm even just talking people in their 40s and 50s where they're starting to consider long term care options and being able to do that through a company sponsored um, benefit plan is really helpful. Um, another thing to consider is leave for all parents. Now, those of you who maybe who are here in Massachusetts or other states that um, require a parental leave uh, that is um, gender neutral, um, you know, that's a, a, a requirement by law. But 
here, uh, but a lot of states don't have those options and there is nothing at the federal level beyond FMLA. So it's really important to make sure that we're not talking about maternity leave or paternity leave. We're talking about parental leave and making sure that you're being consistent. If you're offering parental leave to a heterosexual couple, if you're, uh, you also want to, um, or, or I'm sorry, if you want to offer, say, um, maternity leave to a female employee who's having a baby, then a gay couple who is adopting a child should also be offered parental leave. Um, along those same lines is our caregiver benefits. Um, and this is really getting to be, again, more and more important. So when I talk about caregiver benefits, we're talking about child care benefits, um, but also benefits for those who are caring for aging parents. Um, so uh, it can be as simple as offering an FSA uh, for dependent care. So an FSA can cover um, your expenses. You can put aside money pre-tax and an employer can actually contribute to it if they want to. Um, for children under the age of 13. Um, and then it also will allow an employee who has a spouse that needs care to use it for that as well. <clears throat> but you can also think about offering your own type of benefits. Um, or then again, maybe even flexible schedules again for somebody who is caring. Let's say you have an elderly parent who has uh, Alzheimer's and they are in a day program and you need to maybe adjust the schedule to make sure that we can accommodate, you know, drop off and pick up um, or maybe offering that um, different uh, benefits that might be uh, helpful. Even talking to local, say, child care centers to offer discounts to your local, to your employees, for example. Maybe you uh, go to a national chain of, of um, child care centers to say, listen, we, we, we're, we're in a many, many different states. We'd love to uh, promote your business by offering our employees a discount by using you. So there are definitely different ways to go about this. Um, look at your uh, holidays. Um, think about giving uh, floating holidays or personal holidays. Again, I, I talked about earlier that 69% of the, uh, the uh, population uh, identifies as Christian, which means there's 31% of the population that doesn't celebrate Christmas. Now, Christmas is a federal holiday, which is why businesses are generally closed on Christmas. But you know, a lot of businesses are still offering uh, Good Friday or Easter or others as paid holidays. Consider then uh, changing that up a little bit and offering floating holidays or personal days so that people of uh, different religions or different ethnicities can celebrate um, events or, or holidays that are important to them. Um, family building benefits. This is kind of an interesting, um, interesting uh, new uh, line of benefits that a lot of employers are putting in place. So a lot of, of medical benefits now uh, for, for um, fertility are created for heterosexual couples. In fact, if you want to have, say, IVF, uh, you actually have to have an infertility diagnosis. But there are other reasons that people go for IVF. So you want to make sure that your family building benefits are part of the benefit package that you offer. Um, considering offering stipends for, um, say, maybe adoption uh, uh, costs or surrogacy costs. Um, years ago, when I was in-house HR for company, we put a, um, a five thousand uh, dollar benefit in for adoption, and it wasn't. It, you know, first off, people thought, "Wow, that's a lot of money," but it's not like every employee is going to run out and adopt a child because you're offering that benefit. But what it says to a a, a, a gay couple that want to adopt or want to engage a surrogate so they can have a family, um, it says that they are welcome, they're included. Uh, wellness benefits, uh, although wellness benefits are not new, the pandemic has really placed a renewed emphasis on supporting employers' physical, employees, excuse me, physical and mental well-being. Um, and student loan repayment. Now, I know we've spent a lot of time over the last number of years kind of trying to attract our millennials and our Gen Zers. Uh, but, you know, again, we're getting into a, a place in history or we are in a place in history where we really have four different generations in the workforce. A lot of people who are um, from the Gen X generation are still paying student loans. So one of the interesting uh, part of one of the pandemic relief packages that got passed in Congress is that employers can provide up to $5,250 in student loan repayment benefits tax-free th tax through 2025. 
different ways to go about doing this. There's actually, um, you can uh, actually set up a plan where instead of, a, an employee can choose that instead of contributing to their 401k plan, you can take that same money and, and pay part of their student loans. Really interesting concepts. There are so many more ideas floating out there that you can find online. All right, and with that, I'm gonna send it over to Jen to uh, finish it up. All right, thank you, Sherry. So focusing on making your workplace more diverse, equitable, and inclusive is not only the right thing to do, but it also makes good business sense. It can benefit your bottom line. And I wanted to share a few statistics with you that I thought were pretty impactful. Companies with racial and ethnic diversity are 35% more likely to perform at a higher level. Companies with females at the top management sector saw greater returns. More specifically, diverse management boosts revenue by 19%. And highly inclusive companies are more likely to hit their financial target goals by up to 120%. So that sounds pretty good to me. Um, so we also know employee retention has been a significant issue for most businesses throughout the Great Recession with high turnover costing businesses time and money with the potential to create a negative impact on employee morale. And research has shown that organizations who lead in diversity and inclusion report higher rates of employee retention. So why not uh, you know, reap the many rewards of a diverse and inclusive workplace? Catalyst, a nonprofit that works with companies on issues related to inclusion and gender disparity, surveyed employees in 2019 and found positive experience of it positive experiences of inclusion explained 20% of employees intent to stay at the organization. When employees feel a sense of belonging, like they can show up as their whole, whole selves at work, they're going to be more committed to the company and stay at the company for a longer period of time. And diverse teams typically result in more innovation, faster problem solving, and greater productivity which makes a whole lot of sense when you think about teams who are very similar, maybe always agreeing and just keep pushing on with the status quo versus a group of employees who are contributing different perspectives. You're bound to come up uh, with more outside of the box ideas and solutions. And the survey from Catalyst also found that positive experiences of inclusion explained 49% of team problem solving abilities and 35% of work engagement. And as we've mentioned, the U.S. is only becoming more and more diverse, so you can reach a wider customer base by hiring people who reflect the diversity of the communities where you do business. And it's also good PR. Customers will appreciate your organization's commitment to diversity and inclusion, and they may be more likely to want to do business with you uh, than over your competitors. Um, and I think we also had a, a statistic from uh, the NFL, Sherry, you'll have to remind uh, uh uh, join in on this if you remember further details, but the NFL uh, reported, I believe it was in 2020, that their fan base is now comprised of 40%, 47% of their fan base is now women. So this has really changed the way they have to approach um, marketing. Um, I read that it actually has changed the way they're now thinking about the commercials that are being featured on the Super Bowl. Now that almost half of the people watching the Super Bowl are women, um, they've uh, had to think about different ways that they're going to have to engage with this, this um, more diverse uh, viewership. So it, it is really important, not only for um, your employees, but also for your, your customers as well. Right. There's, I mean, when you start thinking about, uh, it's funny, uh, we just had Mother's Day, you know, a few weeks ago, we got Father's Day coming up. Pay attention to the ads. It is, it is really, really funny. You see ads, you know, uh, selling dad's tools and mom's perfume, right? Um, we really were not uh, necessarily addressing from a business perspective. We really do want to make sure that we're being inclusive. So that um, I, I was uh, telling Jen yesterday, I had taken, um, I have, I took a, a certificate program in diversity and inclusion um, at Cornell, and uh, one of the projects I had to do was looking at a, a cosmetic company. I'm sorry, I may be pronouncing this wrong. I believe it's called Shishido or Shishido. Um, and one of the interesting things that they do is we, a lot of cosmetic companies, you only see the cosmetics featured on women, but they've identified that that not only women wear cosmetics um, and a lot of men will wear different types, you know, whether it's bronzer or concealer or uh, whether it's, you know, maybe the trans community, um, you know, there are, there are more, there's more than just women who are buying their products. So they've really shifted their focus, which I thought was a really interesting, um, interesting way to look at it. 
So we did get a few questions, a couple of questions in, Jen. So there was one question that said, I also heard folks is not an acceptable term to use. Now, I haven't personally heard that. I don't know about you, Jen. Uh, I haven't either, no. No, but I will say that there is the language is constantly changing because as again as we as people are feeling more and more comfortable to speak up and say hey this language or these things that you're doing are really making me feel excluded this is how these shifts are changing so um that one i haven't heard but um wouldn't be surprised um, and somebody asked about uh, information on the student loan repayment options for employers. Um, I am going to send that to uh, some information to Katie. So when she sends out the uh, slide deck and the uh, link to the recorded session, um, I'll have her send that uh, information out as well. And uh, let's see. And with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Katie to uh, take us home. Thank you, Sherry and Jen. Lots of valuable information on DEI and ROI. The MPHR team is here to help guide your organization on any HR compliance issues. If you would like to learn more about how we can assist your organization, please visit our website and set up a short 15-minute call. Be sure to join us next week on the same day and time for our webinar on DEI, top legal challenges, and best practices for protecting your organization. Visit our website to register and see the full calendar of upcoming events and available resources. We will be sending out a recording of today's webinar with the presentation slides this afternoon. Thanks for joining us and have a terrific day.